Happy Sabbath, Sirdus family. It's good to see you all. Um, today might be our last small group for 2023. So for today's discussion, a little bit of a questions will be um, about um, wrapping up our past year of 23 and beginning of the year of 24. Today, uh, we are going to go through the chapter 3 and 4 of Book of Ruth. It will be the last time of studying Ruth. And next um, week will be a starting of a new book, as we announced before. All right. Uh, so I always wanted to stop it here, go through chapter 3 and 4, uh, and then come back to the video. Okay. All right. I hope that everyone has done reading uh, of chapter 3 and 4. Okay, after listening to her mother's Naomi, her mother Naomi's suggestions, it is a story of Ruth going to the Boaz um, and kind of like begging to marry her. And Boaz decides that with his will, uh, he will consider the woman and marry her through the process. And as we see from chapter three, that um, Ruth goes into um, the Boaz home uh, uh, during the night. And as we as we can also see from that that exact scene, Boaz is telling Ruth that he will wait for the right process uh, from the chapter four, and then to get into the marriage relationship. And also as we can see, as we can also see from the scene, um, Christians are to marry through the right process and right timing, not through their own direction or illegal desires. Because the um, Bible never writes that they were having an inadequate relationship even before marriage. They were right. They were waiting to the right timing. Uh, so I hope that's, that could be a little lesson as we start today's uh, story. Uh, but what is unusual about this marriage scene is because uh, between Ruth and Boaz, uh, there is one final verse of the book of Ruth, which states that they were both Gentile uh, descendants, and their, but their offsprings would be the kings of Israel. Boaz was the son of Rahab. We know Rahab from the prostitute from the, uh, the from the castle of Jericho, and Ruth was also a Gentile Moabite. So these two get to marry. Well, we can say that nothing was royal on their own background, but their offsprings goes into Jesse and David, who becomes the king of the nation of Israel. So I want to ask tonight: Is this even possible, or? What was the good feature of Boaz or Ruth that made them into a royal family later on? Are they a good a kingmaker material? Or what was that special in their family or in Boaz that made him special a kingmaker in his family? Since he was in the line of kings prepared by God, there must be something special about this royal family to become. Right? So I get to ask, was he young and rich? Was Boaz a young and rich man who can redeem one's life easily? Or could it be the one of the features that Jehovah was making his family into the royal family later on? Boaz does seem to have a lot of well, plenty of money to begin with. He was able to afford to buy Ruth and Naomi's remaining land. So that could be a good evidence that he must have had some of the qualities with his richness or his, his wealth. But was he handsome or young? I doubt it. Because from uh, chapter 4 and 3, they keep um, asking Boaz that you, are you sure you're getting this young woman into your family? Which means Ruth, maybe she would be her in her 30th. She also was... Um, not a not a super young woman, but they are saying, "Oh, Boaz, compared to you, this Ruth is a young woman." We can assume that Boaz was an older man, probably in his forties or fifties, maybe, which means he may not have been a super smart, good-looking guy. That we can uh, frame him as a young and rich. He might be rich, but a little old, right? So, like our modern uh, requirements for a good material, feel, a good marriage fear. He was not uh, there yet, right? Then we can also ask him, does he does he have a generous mind? Um, is his mind as wide as the ocean, right? Like this little dog in here, I'm about to attack you with love and kindness. Like, was he super tender, super uh, generous, kind, that everyone kind of leans onto him? Like, was he a king material? 
I would say yes, that he was a man with a king's heart. Yes, he was a man that deserves a royal position. He knew when to go, where to stop, and how to go. And even if like it meant losing money, he never hesitated making decisions in the settings. And to rightly understand this, we need to understand a little bit about Israel's land system. After Israel's exodus, which ended after like 400 years in Egypt, they arrived in the land of Canaan, as we all know, right? And after successfully conquering the land of Canaan, the picture that we see from uh, the map right now is the, the land of Israel, which used to be the land of Canaan. So they conquered all the land of Canaan, and then the land was divided equally among the 12 tribes by um, Joshua, right? And the way they did it is that the land was divided by the tribe. As you see from uh, from the picture, Manasseh, Asher, Naphtali, Zebulon, Ishagar, West Manasseh, Gal, Reuben, Judah, they all divided by the tribe um, according to their own proportion of uh, their own work, right? And then they also divided by the family. Within this um, colored land, they divided also by the family of um, how big they were. And that was it. What I mean by that, that was it. And what I mean by that is that God commanded that it would remain this way forever. Like this picture right now should be the same thousand years later, 2,000 years later. Meaning that unlike today's modern world where land could be a, one of the property that could be bought and sold with the money, for Israel is a little different. The land given to Israel was theirs forever to manage and cultivate for generations to come. And once it was given, you can never you can never give it out or you can never sell out to make some money out of your own land because it is own proper it is own property that was given by God as a blessing, right? And that also explains a little bit of um. Israelite and Palestinian war because there was one time uh, when Israel was trying to give the Palestinians uh, the land of West Bank and Gaza, right? But before before that, before when Palestinians were asking for their own rights, Israel were um, conquering, they were owning um, every part of this um, Israel. However, uh, West Bank is a little um, downside here, downside on the um, green part. Right, and then um, Israel government was trying to give some land portion to the Palestinians, right, in order to uh, maintain a little bit of peace within the land. And there was this picture that was captured that this Israelite, um, the babies, like children, five, six year olds, that doesn't really understand the concept of uh, politics or the lands or properties or any of the money, right? And they were captured crying that they don't want to live. I mean, they don't want to leave, not live, I'm sorry, that they don't want to leave their own home and own country. And they used to say that, oh, this is the land our Jehovah used to give us or our Jehovah um, gave us as a blessing. And this is the land that we inherited from our ancestors and we should not leave them alone. Because this was the concept they used to have for a thousand years that this holy land this is also the good reason explains why the Israelites were trying so hard to come back to this land because in their conception, in their mind, God-given land, this holy land can never be bought, can never be sold, can never be even lended out to someone else. In other words, the ability to make money with the land was limited. However, however, in the Bible, there was only, only one case to buy land or to sell your land within one and only situation, with only one setting. And that one setting is from today's chapter. When all the men in the family had died and there is no one else that is left to inherit the land, it was only the women's. In this case, a close relative was able to buy the land for more with their money and make it theirs forever. In this case, when the trade was um, completed, they forever uh, belonged to the person who bought it. That's why when we see from chapter 4, verse 4, 
that this close relative comes into the village and when they were having a meeting that he says, oh, I will redeem it. Thinking, oh, if I buy this land, I can make a good profit, right? My family will be bigger if I make this trade successful. However, but then in verse six, two verses later, he changes his mind. We can discover that and says that I cannot redeem it because I might endanger my own estate. What does this mean? Why did he change his mind after one verse, knowing better about the situation? We can explain it this way. It was because of the condition that the man is responsible not only for the land, but also for the woman, Ruth and Naomi. Upon hearing, this uh, upon hearing this condition, the man walks away from the deal, unwilling to lose money because in his mind, he thought maybe he could make some money out of this land. But knowing not only getting the land, but also his getting the risky conditions, which is to embrace Naomi and Ruth into their family, he was hesitating. I'm not sure if I'm ready for this. I am for sure ready for the blessings that is ready in store for me. But I'm not sure for the risky conditions to embrace in my life. And I think this is a crucial point where the difference between Boaz and the men comes in. Because right at that moment, Boaz comes and then seals the deal by saying that he will redeem the family. But did Boaz make this decision to increase his land or to make a profit out of it? Instead, we see that he made a decision to help Ruth, who was in danger. From chapter 2 and 3, we see Boaz constantly asking Ruth to come to his household, to get help, to ask for help, to stay together because he cared for the woman in danger. When Boaz was making a deal, it was not about him making a profit. He already had enough money, enough profit, enough wealth in his family. But it was all about him rescuing her from the situation. Not a man who makes decisions based on a profit, but a man who makes decisions based on a risk. And that was Boaz. In this short story from chapter 1 to 4, Ruth symbolizes us, someone from a humble background. We know that she is a Moabite woman. That sounds simple, but Moab, the country of Moab, started from father and daughter having an inadequate relationship with each other, and the son was named Moab, that their beginning of the nation was very immoral, full of shame, and full of sin as well. So Ruth was no one who is worthy of becoming a mother of the Savior or mother of the King. And just like that, we are also risky to be redeemed. But Jesus, like Boaz, did not come to benefit us, but he came to love us even at our own risk. It was the salvation that we do not deserve. And it was the death that we do not also deserve. And all Ruth had to do here in this chapter, in this whole book, was to accept the invitation. And so she became the mother of the king later on. I want to ask you tonight, as we close to chapter 423, are we accepting this royal invitation today? Or am I waiting for Jesus to come and embrace my whole life? Or are we making Jesus a way that's outside for me to be perfect and sinless? That he cannot make it in the end. Let us look back. And if, if his invitation, his royal invitation is made into my life tonight, let us accept it, embrace it, and he will change our life into royal king's family life. 
So thank you for coming again to our um, worship today. And as this promise awaits for us, that he will redeem my family, that he will redeem my life and my business and my future and dreams as well. Let his providence be our guideline for the year of 2024 today. Thank you again. Um, and I, I, I am really um, uh, waiting for the next week to come. I uh, cannot make it uh, this Sabbath, but I hope all of us uh, can be there to celebrate the Sabbath that God has given us for uh, the last Sabbath for 2023. Um, as we have um, announced, uh, the year-end party is um, planned for tomorrow, Sabbath dinner. So please be there. Um, and a lot of gifts are also uh, ready with the games. So I hope that this, could, this could be the time uh, that everyone could share the love and kindness that used to be our church culture. Thank you again. And have a happy, blessed Sabbath.